Hi there, Mac. How are you? Good morning, Ashray, Iowa. Yeah. We've been trying to get me down in Iowa, and <laughs> boy, we had to work hard this year not to get me there. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for doing it this way. And this is this is Dan here, Mac. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much for doing this. Our pleasure. Uh, do you want me to start sharing my screen to make sure it's grabbing if the right would, one or sure if you would that'd be perfect yep and i'll kind of mute in and out i've got working from home of course and we've got plenty of background noise here so imagine that looks looks good And Mick, you you are in lacrosse. I am. Yep. Cool. How's the volume level on the headset? I had to get a new pay a new headset because my I broke my old one. I used it too much. <laughs> it sounds great and clear here. Good. Yeah. Uh, for this for the chilled water system designs, Mick, we we won't we won't need any breakouts, will we? Correct. Correct. Perfect. And for the. Uh, for the ethics, I we did decide we're just going to do, we'll we'll break out based on I think we've got a few extras that are uh, signed up yet this morning, so mm -hmm. we're just going to do the random breakout. So it might not be the same group every time, but we should be able to get about five to six in each in each breakout room. Okay, and then how do we call them back? Uh, I I can send a message to the participants. Okay, perfect. You just let us know how much time we want on the clock, and I can I can do a little timer here so um and then for for the evaluations at the end we we do have an anonymous poll set up through here so we'll capture the data through through zoom good uh, port that back through is is what we were recommended by by liz at the region perfect And there aren't really 127 slides. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. I don't, even, I don't see the slide count on there, but. Did you have a nice Thanksgiving, Mick? We did. It was pretty small, pretty relaxing. Fairly, fairly low key for most, I'm sure. Yeah, tried to tried to stay away. Mm -hmm. How about yourself? Yeah, pretty similar. We did we did go see my parents, but it was a pretty small, small gathering and mm -hmm. uh it was good. Mostly got got a couple couple projects done as well. I just did a, did a little had to replace my garage door header, so I was finishing up that project over the weekend. Okay. Yeah, my wife has been finding me projects, <laughs> but we have, we agree to them mutually though. Is that what she tells you, Mick? <laughs> No, we we work pretty well together, actually. That's good. That's good. Thanks yeah, again for uh, being willing to speak to us. Really appreciate oh, you taking the time today. My pleasure. Yeah. I I told her the presentations this week 
uh, reduce the wear and tear on the body. Absolutely. But, yeah, well, that's the good side. The bad side is we're not together. Totally. That's definitely been a challenge for our chapter. Yep. Well, you're a very congenial and um, a chapter that feeds off of one another and works together very well. Yeah, we've had a, had a good history of, of being well networked and mm -hmm. uh, getting together and having good meetings. So it's, yep. it's definitely a struggle to, uh, to be apart, but I, especially given how things are in Iowa, it just seems like the best bet for now. So have you had other virtual meetings this fall? Um, we have. I'm trying to think of when our most recent one was. Um, it's been over a month now because we've been a student already. Uh, we had a we have a pretty active student chapter at Iowa State University that we're connected with, and uh, we do generally have a panel of industry professionals that gets together and offers uh, advice and yeah. discussion points with the students. And then uh, in a normal year, we would go on some tour of whatever's new being built at Iowa State mm -hmm. and then end with dinner, of course. Uh, no tour, no dinner this year. So we still had a panel. Um, this year we had uh, all female presenters from a wide variety of uh, industry roles, sales, consulting, um, owner representation cool. uh, type positions. And I thought it went really well. It went on longer than I thought it would. We, we spoke for, well, they did all the speaking, really. I tried to moderate, didn't get in the way too much, I don't think. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, we went for an hour and a half on a Zoom okay. meeting and had good student participation. Of course, we got to hand out some scholarships too. So that's always good as well. Especially if they have to be there to get them. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you do see some student uh, involvement wane after after the student meeting, but uh, we've actually been pretty fortunate in the last few years to get more continued student involvement. I know uh, Dan and I were at Iowa State at the same time, and when we were there, it, it was one meeting uh, as students and maybe two, and sure. then the, the annual Iowa chapter joint meeting, and that was it. So I, I'm happy to at least see some of the students showing up at, at our meetings, uh, participating a little bit more. Yeah. Feel, is there, uh, is lacrosse associated with any student chapters? We have a student branch with the Technical College here. Mm -hmm. And then a small, it's usually been a liberal arts school, Viterbo University has started an engineering program. Uh, UW Lacrosse has pre-engineering and then people usually would go on to either Platteville, Madison or Milwaukee. So that'd be like two years in lacrosse and then two years somewhere else or three right. or whatever mm -hmm. it takes to finish. Yep. Interesting. Hello, Rick. Hey, what's up? Just, uh, you know, having a conversation, waiting for people to join in. Hello, Mick. Hello, Mr. Hermans. Interesting Zoom background. Thank you. That's your new headquarters. Yes, I recognize it. Very good. You been there yet? Uh, before it was like this. <laughs> yeah, I, I drove around it. Uh, um, I rented a car and drove around it once, and that was a long time ago. It looked like a really nice place. Well, you know, when you when you buy 1970s building and you look at it, you go, oh, this has some real possibilities. And I guess it's very nice 
from the pictures we've seen. Yeah, pictures are very nice. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the tour was by uh, Chuck and uh, mm -hmm. Ginger was great. Yep. So I'll, I'll uh, join you for uh, chill water, but I, I uh, unfortunately I'll skip the ethics. Okay. <laughs> How should we take that? I'm not sure. He probably doesn't. He, I've he, already got my ethics training for my registration. So there I'm, you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah, you want to save it for the next biennial. There you go. Yeah. yeah. No, I can't do that. Minnesota won't let you do that. No, but I mean, if you don't take it now, then you can go to the ASHRAE one in the future. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I figure I'll, uh, I'll probably keep my license for one more cycle. Mm -hmm. Um. And that that kind of depends upon what happens uh, after I'm off the board next year. Okay. Assuming I'm off the board, uh, so we'll see. I, I you know I'm not going to keep the license forever. Right. Do Minnesota and Wisconsin have a minimum number of ethics credits per yeah, two renewal? Hours. Two hours every biennium. Same for Wisconsin. Okay. Iowa took that up. I think last year or the year before it was the first year. Um, so now we're trying to, to be in a cycle of offering one a year. Mm -hmm. That'll get our members what they need. That's excellent. That's excellent. You get good uh, turnout that way. It does drive some turnout. That's true. I see some so names you me, don't Adam, normally. Did you, Adam, did you get the uh, silver gavel in the mail? Uh, I haven't seen it. I don't know if it was being sent to me or Brian or David. Probably oh, David. yeah, it may not have gone to you. You should find it and show it off at the chapter meeting. That would be a good idea. Uh, I don't know. I think Brian and or I know Brian was going to get on. If it went to him, maybe he has it. I'm not sure. There was one chapter years ago who never got the silver gavel during the year. It, it remained unfound. It was lost for a while. Yep. Yes. <laughs> it was lost for a while. Very embarrassed chapter. Um, but, you know, that has happened from time to time. In fact, we oh, lost yeah. our hornblower. Mm -hmm. um, the bugle disappeared. I believe it disappeared at Iowa, as a matter of fact. Uh, I think that's true. I'm not sure where it went. I, yeah. think, I think they just figured since they won it every year, there was no reason to... <laughs> To we'll bring have to it ask back. Jason Kems about that. He oh, well, it was lacrosse it. this year that won it. That's true, and they got a new one, right? Yes, Mark Miller uh, uh, got a new bugle, and uh, that's the one that was awarded. And as far as I know, the sousaphone is still in Milwaukee. I'm sure, it'll stay there permanently. I'm with lacrosse, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm just going to listen in. I'll try not to take up any of your time here no worries i think we're gonna thanks for coming get started in a couple minutes we have 27 in the room right now of 38 registrants so you want to give it a couple minutes, Adam, or take it away whenever you'd like? I, I was literally about to ask you that very question, so thank you. Uh, I think we should wait a couple more minutes, see if we get more people to sign on, but I do have a little uh, pre-meeting spiel, so we'll get that started in, let's say, two minutes, and then if people join while I'm chatting, that's fine. I'm not the, the draw here, so.
test, test. All right, well, it's a few minutes after and we've got most of the participants, so let's get started. And there's a little bit of uh, ASHRAE Iowa business to take care of, and uh, then we'll hand it over to Mick. Uh, thank you for joining us today for the chapter meeting. I'm your chapter president this year, Adam Pulse. Uh, today, we're fortunate to have ASHRAE Distinguished Lecturer Mick Schwedler present on chill water and ethics. Uh, hopefully you can join us for both sessions. Before we get underway, I'd like to quickly cover some of the Iowa chapter business. If you haven't already donated to our research promotion campaign, uh, please consider ASHRAE in your season of giving this year. Uh, our RP chairs, Jaden and Nick uh, Seymour, would be happy to assist any uh, donation questions you might have or, or struggles with the website. They're the, they're the guys in the know. Uh, unfortunately, due to COVID, uh, we are not able to have our normal joint ASHRAE, SMACNA, and CSI uh, December meeting. Instead, we'll be hosting an Iowa chapter virtual happy hour on December 17th at 4 p.m. Uh, you should see sign up information for that meeting shortly. I know it's not the easiest or most enjoyable way to socialize but we hope you'll consider joining us in drinking a toast to the end of 2020. And of course, we couldn't have a toast uh, for the Iowa chapter without our trademarked A. If you haven't been to CRC, then maybe you don't know what I'm talking about, but um, Dan Zog really is the only one who does it justice, I think. Uh, there's a lot of uh, yelling and, and drinking when Dan Zog's around. So if you see him, ask him about it. He'd be happy to, to give you all the details in history. Um, our January meeting gets us back on track with some quality learning opportunities and will be a discussion on airside testing and balancing. Uh, more normalcy and good news uh, for the new year is the arrival of our product directories. Uh, solicitation letters have been collected and the product directory committee, which is Holly Elbert, uh, is working to get them finished and sent out early next year. So big thanks to Holly for all her work on those. After the meeting, uh, attendance sheets for proof of attendance will be posted on the website and we will alert you um, attendees of that posting via email so that you can collect your PDHs as necessary. Uh, finally, a request that at the end of this session, you remain on the line after Mick has a chance to leave to fill out the DL evaluation form. Uh, using the poll only allows for numerical data entry. So uh, if you have additional written comments, please send in a private chat or an email to Dan Blake. Um, but yeah, stay on the session and uh, help fill out that DL evaluation, please. Um, now let's get to Mick. Uh, Mick has been involved in the development and support of HVAC systems for trains since 1982. As an applications engineer, his areas of expertise include system optimization, in which he holds patents, as well as chill water and water source heat pump system design. His primary activities include assisting designers in proper application of train products and systems in buildings and writing system application manuals and newsletters. Nick serves as president elect on the ASHRAE board of directors and is also an ASHRAE fellow. He's a recipient of ASHRAE's exceptional service, distinguished service and standards achievement awards. He was chair of the SSPC 90.1 2010 as well as chair of the Advanced Energy Design Guide Steering Committee. Mick has served on several USGBC technical and education groups, chaired the lead technical committee, and served on the lead steering committee. He also authored portions of the ASHRAE Green Guide and served on technical groups for the new building institute. All right, with that, I will send it over to you, Mick. Thanks so much, Adam. It's great to be sort of in Iowa. I was kind of looking forward to driving on I-90, taking one turn on 35, and then being in Des Moines. But we're going to do this virtually instead. Uh, so today we're going to talk about chill water system decisions. And what we'd like to start out with is this is part of the Distinguished Lecture Program, and that's it's a, a, 
a benefit of being an ASHRAE member. And it's put together by the Chapter Technology Transfer Committee. Each year they uh, identify people who can deliver presentations. And then those presentations are made to the chapters where transportation is paid by ASHRAE. And, basically through your dues. So this is a benefit directly to the members. Um, I wanna thank all the volunteers, Adam. I, I mean, I, I, I've seen everybody at the CRCs. It's, you have a very active chapter. It's an awesome chapter. You work very well together. And what I tell people is that if you have a passion somewhere in the industry, there's a place for you to help volunteer at ASHRAE. You don't have to do it all by yourself. The IO chapter, your chapter has a lot of people involved. So even if you just want to start helping out with some things, learn some things, develop your network more. These are great ways of particularly for younger people to develop uh, skills that you may not have the chance to develop in the professional workplace. Um, the course description today is, is long because uh, there are a bunch of different subjects and I'll talk about how those work. Uh, this is available if you're a registered architect. It's registered with AIA for continuing education as a continuing education provider, and that information can be shared with you. It's also uh, registered with the U.S. Green Building Council or through GBCI, and we have a course ID for that for one general continuing education hour for that. Uh, so our learning objectives are well, we're going to help you understand things from a system when you make design decisions in a chill water system, what kind of things do you weigh? Because there's there very rarely is only one way to do something. Uh, in order to really make the best decision for your clients and to, to give them the best design in a particular application in a particular building, you have to understand both the advantages and the disadvantage. So we're gonna talk about the, the, the good parts, but sometimes people stop there. We're also gonna talk about the harder parts, those disadvantages, and we wanna help you get your projects done quickly, have, have them work for your clients and basically keep them out of trouble. So uh, when we do this in person, we allow the audience to pick the six menu. Uh, what the, your local board of governors pick the six. So if we wanna do more in the future, we can pick a different six. So we're gonna start out with a bypass line sizing was the first one that the board of governors picked. So we're going to talk about two different system types. First, a primary secondary system, and then a variable primary flow system. When we have a primary secondary system, we have two way valves on the coils, variable speed drives on the distribution pumps, constant flow through the chiller evaporators, and then a bypass line with no valves and uh, no no uh, devices that makes up the difference between the variable flow that's going out to our loads and the constant flow going through the chillers. <clears throat> the way we can determine whether or not we can disable a chiller, that is to turn one off, is when we have enough excess flow in this bypass line. So the chilled water is being produced and we have flow in this bypass line. When we get to the point where when we turn a chiller off and it's pump off, we still have excess flow in the bypass line, we know that when we turn it off, we won't have to cycle that chiller back on. And then we probably want to have a, a little bit of leeway in there, uh, a dead band. So generally, the bypass line is sized to be to allow 110% of the largest chiller's flow rate. Because that, that's the maximum flow rate that the bypass line should see, because if it goes above that, we should... the a sequence of operation for the chiller plant controller should sequence the chiller off. So some designers use 110%, some use 115%. So how, how do we know when we're in the plant or when we're looking at drawings what the bypass line is? Well, first of all, we look for our chillers. In this case, we have two different ch chiller sizes, three large chillers, one smaller chiller. We have a five inch line going into the smaller chiller, usually it's a six, just because they're easier to get. And then we have some 10 inch lines going out to the to the large chillers. Uh, we look for the bypass line. The bypass line is going to be um, a pipe between the chilled water supply and the chilled water return. And generally it's going to be between the secondary pumps, the, the, the distribution pumps 
and the chilled water pumps. In this case, we see that the bypass line is a 10 inch bypass. And therefore, it's really a quick way to find out is the bypass line the right size. And I frankly, when I get a chilled water system diagram, which happens multiple times every week, this is the first thing I look for in a primary secondary system. It's easy to find on paper. So it's usually uh, simple to find in the plant as long as we follow where the where the wa water is going from where the pumps are. Okay. Now. There are some issues if the bypass line is missized. And frankly, we see this on large chilled water plants quite often, and it, it can cause some problems. So we'll talk about what the issue is, the problems, and then what you could possibly do to take care of this. So we have an example here, uh, pardon me. We have an example, and this is a university plant. It's a, a large plant, and the bypass size is the same as the manifold. And it's a short bypass line. So we have our chilled water supply pipe, our chilled water return pipe, and the bypass line is only eight feet long. So there's very little pressure drop. Well, what happens is that we have water that's being produced from our chillers and it's being sent out to the chilled water system supply and the coils. But what happens is when the water gets here, water flows from high pressure to low pressure. And it gets here and it sees this really low pressure drop because the bypass line is so big. So some of the chilled water, instead of going out to the system, actually goes this way in the bypass line. Well, on the return side, the same thing happens. We have warm return water coming from our coils. Some of it, rather than going back to the chillers, sees this very low pressure drop and flows this direction in the bypass line. Well, um, when I teach people about chill water plants, one of the, the rules is you can't have water flowing in opposite direction simultaneously in the same pipe. This seems to violate that rule, but that's because this isn't a pipe, it's a tank. It's too big. So what are the symptoms if this occurs? Well, what we have, we have 40 degree chilled water being made. It mixes with return water from the system, and we are not able to maintain the supply water temperature out going out to the system. So that's one of the systems. Even though our chillers are making their chill water set point, we can't get that set point of going out to the system. It's not the pump heat. A lot of times this is the issue is an oversized bypass line. Another symptom, on the return side, that 40 degree water that's coming through the chill through the bypass line doesn't mix because it's going at a very slow velocity. And the first chiller after the bypass line receives a lower return water temperature. And we can't get that chiller to load because in a primary secondary system, its flow rate is constant. So in this case, it can only load to 9 16 of, it load, of its load, under 60% of its load. And then the chillers down the line get the higher water temperatures. So if you are looking at a system and if you see things like this, the first place to look is generally, is the bypass line the right size? Well, what happens if it isn't the right size? Well, the first thing we'd like to impose a small pressure drop because we do want water to flow freely in each either direction, but we don't want the water to short circuit. So some people put a valve in the bypass line. Well, if you have a 24 inch line, that's a big valve. And by the way, you know, if you have a plant operator, somebody will open the valve and somebody on the next shift will close the valve. So valves and bypass line can get you in trouble from an operational standpoint. Another way to do it to impose a pressure drop would be to put a small plate or a plate with a small hole in it, an orifice, if you will, to impose some pressure drop. But in either case, you have to drain the system to install those. So once this is installed out in the field, it frankly is hard to fix. So the best part is to basically make sure the bypass line is sized properly. Now, there will be times when the bypass line is sized properly, but the, flow, but the pipe size is real short. The length is real short. And what happens then is, again, it's a very low pressure drop and you can experience similar system, symptoms. 
So in a case like this, this is from a university project. What they did, they we have our chilled water supply pipe, our chilled water return pipe, and they put some elbows in here. So they took the water flow rate out of the supply side, took it down the pipe, put it over to another couple elbows and back into the return side. So what this does, this imposes a small pressure drop in the system, but it keeps water from short circuiting because of the short bypass um, line. You usually want your bypass line to be 10 pipe diameters or larger so that there's a small pressure drop, but not too much. Now let's go on to a variable primary flow system. In a variable primary flow system, the bypass line is a differently sized. And that's because now it doesn't have to be sized for 110% of the largest chiller's flow rate. It only needs to be sized for the largest minimum flow rate. Usually that's the minimum flow rate of the largest chiller, but depending on the chillers in the plant, it's the largest minimum flow rate. So with the pipe, for the bypass line should be smaller than the pipe going into your largest chiller. So in this case, we have uh, two different size chillers. The minimum flow rate of the largest chiller is 480 GPM. That's a six inch line. We go to our drawing if we can find it. And there's our six inch line here. And we do have the right size line. So again, um, it's pretty simple. It's simple to find on drawings, a little bit harder in the field, but once you find that line, you can determine, is it the proper size? So just to summarize, in a primary secondary system, 110 to 115% of the largest chiller's flow rate and 10 pipe diameters long. If it's shorter than that, put in a, a U-bend like we showed uh, with, with a couple of elbows to impose a small pressure drop. In a variable primary flow, the length isn't critical because we have a control valve in that bypass line and it's size for the largest minimum flow rate of all the chillers there. So that's bypass line sizing. Let's see what the Board of Governors uh, pick next. Uh, use of existing coils. Um, a lot of people think that coils are designed for a particular delta T. I tell people coils are just dumb pieces of metal. They don't know anything. Their job working with a control valve is to transfer heat. So if we give a coil colder water, it will use less of that water and the return water temperature will go up. So coils aren't designed for a particular flow rate and delta T. They are selected for a particular flow rate and delta T. So if we want to, we can give the coil colder water, reduce the flow rate, and reduce our pumping energy. And that's really uh, the benefit of having a higher delta T and a lower flow rate. The pump power is changes with about the cube of the flow rate. So we get, for uh, increasing the delta T, we get a significant reduction in pumping power. And that's the goal with doing this. Uh, that's one of the reasons ASHRAE standard 90.1 2016 started to require you to select coils with at least a 15 degree temperature difference. Now there are exceptions. We're not gonna go through those today, but on our air handlers, at least a 15 degree temperature difference with a minimum 57 degree return water temperature. So our new selection parameters should be in the range of 57 to 42 rather than they were where they've been in the past. So from a coil heat transfer standpoint, uh, it just transfers heat using that LMTD log mean temperature difference. If we get a colder water, it will use less of the water, it will come back warmer. So let's take an air handler that's already been selected, it's already out in the field, and it was selected at 45 to 55 degrees. It is a 20,000 CFM and we, we get the 783 MBH for the coil. Now the goal in this case is to do a retrofit, supply that coil with colder water and use less of that water. Well, in this case, what we have, we have uh, this coil and when we give it colder water, say 41 degree water, the water returns at about 57 degrees. Hmm. So we went from a 10 degree delta T 
to a 17 to a 16 degree delta T approximately, we had the same leaving air conditions, the same capacity. Therefore, nothing happens with fan airflow. So if we are um, in, have a system where we are uh, we maximize the flow rate in our pipes, some people think, well, I can't get any more tons out of it. We can by selecting chillers or having the present chillers, if they can, make colder water. What if we did this with a smaller air handler? We have eight rows, but it just doesn't have uh, as much heat transfer capability. In this case, we had to get down to make 38 degree water. It returns at 53 degree water, so we get that 15 degree delta T, but the chillers and its compressor has to use a lot more power. So if you get a reduction in chilled water temperature and a rise of your return water temperature, that's beneficial. So this coil would not work well in um, to, by giving cold water and reducing the flow rate. What was different? Well, if we go back to heat transfer, what we want to stay out, we want to stay out of this transitional area. If we remember, we talked about in heat transfer Reynolds number and having a high Reynolds number to pr promote good heat transfer. Well, in this case, we happen to be in this transitional area. And in this transitional area, the heat transfer goes down and we get that reduced delta T, that, that reduced, we have to reduce the chilled water temperature a lot. Now, one of the things that's kind of surprising is once we get through the transitional region to the laminar flow rate, and what we learned in our textbooks was laminar is bad. Actually, when we get into laminar flow rate, the heat transfer capabilities start to go back up. But what we need to do, we need to avoid where we are in this region, that this transitional point in, in the coil selection. But if you have an existing coil, you can go to the manufacturer, ask them to reselect the coil with colder re chilled water temperature and see wh whether that coil can work well. Well, uh, there's another way you can also enhance the tubes and their heat transfer. It's a way to keep you higher in that uh, transition, above that transitional range. And in this case, with that 41 degree water, we went almost up to 57 degree return water temperature again. And so we were able to take that small coil with the enhanced tubes and increase its heat transfer capabilities. So in retrofit applications, the coils with the high Reynolds numbers, they work well. Um, and also on the smaller coils, enhancing the tubes. Uh, there is a pressure drop for those enhanced tubes, but um, when you have higher delta Ts, you reduce the flow rates and reduce the overall pressure drop. Um, a rule of thumb, which I really hesitate to tell you because they're never, they, they never always work, if that makes sense. That is for every two degrees you give a coil colder water, the return water temperature will come back about one degree warmer. But don't use this, royal, the, this rule of thumb in existing coil. Work with the manufacturer to reselect that coil and find out if it works for the particular coils that you have. Okay, next, your Board of Governors chose uh, minimum and maximum flow limits. So all chillers have minimum and maximum flow limits. Why? Uh, great question. Um, we're going to find out that we, we, in, a, in a chiller, we want to have good heat transfer in the evaporator. We have, want to have good heat transfer in the condenser. And we want to avoid fouling in the tubes. So. Um, why do we want to have a minimum flow rate? Well, if we go below the minimum flow rate, we start to inhibit the heat transfer capability. We get closer to that transitional area that we saw in the, in the previous graph. And what happens is when our heat transfer gets poor, we get a higher approach temperature between the leaving water temperature and the refrigerant temperature. So on the evaporator, that can cause us to get to a, a low temperature in the evaporator and have to turn the chiller off. It can also get to a high temperature in the condenser 
and cause the chiller to get into a place where it's not going to operate well. Um, it can cause the chiller to surge. And what happens when a chiller surges is the compressor is unable to overcome the pressure difference of the refrigerant between the evaporator and the condenser. And refrigerant actually flows alternately backwards and forwards through that compressor. And a, a technical service group that I work with tells me I'm required to tell you, you should not operate a centrifugal and chiller a centrifugal chiller and surge for extended periods of time because you can cause damage to that chiller if you do. Uh, we can also lose capacity. And if we go below the minimum evaporator flow rate, we don't have good control of the supply or the chilled water set point for the chiller. Um, how about the maximum flow rate? Well, with the maximum flow rate, if we go above that, we can start to erode the tubes. We erode the tubes, the longevity goes down, the reliability gets worse, and we might have to replace the chiller earlier or retube that chiller. So stay between the minimum maximum flow rates. Um, from a performance standpoint, um, the work that a compressor has to do is proportional to the load, in this case 1150 tons, and then that pressure differential between the evaporator refrigerant pressure and the condenser refrigerant pressure. Those are proportional to, proportional to the leaving condenser water temperature minus, minus the leaving evaporator water temperature. In this case, a 62 degree lift. Okay. And what we wanna do, we want to get good to performance. We want to stay in this region where we have good heat transfer. So generally, if we stay above one and a half to two feet per second, depending on the tube type, we are going to maintain that uh, good supply water temperature control, the good heat transfer, and the good efficiency. So if any of these issues happen, because we go below the minimum flow rate, we have chiller instability. We also can have that surge that I, I discussed, and that is where the refrigerant pressure in the condenser actually pushes the refrigerant backwards through the compressor. If you've ever been in a, a chilled water plant where the chiller surges, you know two things. One, it's not good. Two, you want to get out of the plant because it's screaming like a banshee or it's shaking. Um, you don't want to operate those chillers in surge. So we talked about the minimum and maximum flow rates stay between them. The manufacturer will tell you what they are for a specific chiller. You wanna have good performance from an efficiency standpoint, stability and reliability for that chiller. Next up, should we manifold pumps or should we dedicate them? And when I'm asked by an engineer or a, a customer, I never tell them which way because I always guess wrong for them for a particular reason. So we're going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of both dedicating pumps and manifolding pumps. So quite often, in uh, we we see dedicated pumps uh, or pumps dedicated to each chiller in a primary secondary system. So in this case, we have a primary pump per chiller. When we turn a chiller on, we turn its pump on. Pretty simple. In a variable primary flow system, we may also have dedicated pumps for chillers. And in this case, when we turn a chiller on, we turn its pump on. Well, when we dedicate pumps to chillers, it becomes simple to operate. The operator goes into this chiller plant, they look at the system control screen. They see chiller A on, pump A on, chiller B off, pump B on. Wait, there's something wrong. Because the chillers and pumps come on in pairs. So it's a very simple way to see whether or not the, the system is operating well. The other part is when we dedicate pumps, if the chillers have different capacities, therefore different flow rates, and particularly different pressure drops. The pumps can be selected for that specific flow rate and for that specific pressure drop. 
So when we have different size chillers or different pressure drop chillers, uh, it may be simpler to select uh, dedicated pumps, but there's some drawbacks. When we dedicate pumps, uh, we don't have the same redundancy. We can mitigate that. We could either double the number of pumps or pipe in what's sometimes referred to as a swing pump. So in this case, we have a pump dedicated for each chiller. And then we have a swing pump. And with valves, this swing pump could work either with this top chiller or with this bottom chiller. And we could change which, which uh, chiller it's working with by opening or closing particular valves. So this is where you have N plus one pumps, but you don't have to have double the number of pumps. Okay. And now let's go to manifolded pumps. Well, the first thing we see with manifolded pumps is since they pump into a header, we now will have to make sure that we have isolation valves because we don't want water flowing through an inactive chiller and diluting or increasing the supply chill water temperature that's going out to our system. Um, benefits of this is now any pump can work with any chiller. So our redundancy is, is much higher. <clears throat> the next part is we can now optimize our pumping separately from optimizing our cooling, particularly in a, in a variable primary flow system. If we have four chillers, we might have two or three pumps. They don't have to be sized together. We, that can help us from a space standpoint in the chilled water plant, but particularly an efficiency standpoint. And the third thing uh, we'll talk about is over pumping of the chillers if the system has experienced what's, what's called low delta T syndrome. There are some disadvantages with manifolding the pumps, particularly with uh, different chillers. And that is if we have, <clears throat> pardon me, if we have different flow rates, the flow has to balance between those two chillers. We might need some balancing valves if we have different flow rates or pressure drops. The second one is, is even harder. Let's say we have two, two or three different chiller sizes in a variable primary flow system. Well, when we get up to the design flow rate of the small chiller, we might not be up to the minimum flow rate for the larger chiller. So now we have to do some gymnastics from a system control standpoint by opening the valve in the bypass line to maintain the minimum flow rates for all the chillers. So it does become harder to get proper um, sequencing in a variable primary flow system if we have different capacity chillers. So those are some disadvantages. Um, <clears throat> This is an example of two chillers with different evaporator pressure drops. So a lot of times people say, well, here are my chiller capacities, here are my flow rates, and here are my pressure drops. The problem is that the water in Iowa is smart. Water flows from high pressure to lower pressure. When both chillers are operating, the pressure drop across the evaporator bundles will be identical because the flow rate through the chiller with a lower pressure drop will go up and the chiller with a higher pressure drop selection will go down until they become equal. So we get a discrepancy in the flow rates. And what happens sometimes if this difference is significant is we find we are not able to load this smaller chiller because its pressure drop is, or its flow rate is lower than design. So we can only load it up to 85% capacity. And if the return water temperature to the large chiller is at design conditions, it can't make set point because we have too high a flow rate. It can only produce a certain delta T and we end up losing our load by 10%. So what you need to do if you have a system like this is if you can select the evaporator pressure drops as close to one another as possible. If you can't get it close enough, you will need to put a balancing valve in series with this chiller one that has the lower pressure drop to bring its pressure drop up to the same pressure drop as chiller two had. So we talked about the advantages 
and disadvantages of manifolded pumps. Frankly, in, in variable primary flow systems, I see manifolded pumps be used a lot. But with identical chillers, it's a lot simpler than if you have either different capacity chillers or chillers with a different uh, pressure drops. Now, let's talk about how the two systems <clears throat> work if we have low delta T. A low delta T syndrome, uh, some people say it can't be solved, but it can. It just have to, has to be done out the, out the air handlers, out of those heat transfer devices. So in this case, we have a chiller that's designed and selected for 750 GPM to take this water from 56 to 40 degrees and it's a 500 ton chiller. The problem is we're not getting the full delta T out of the coils. So the water is returning at 50 degrees and the load, because we're only getting a 10 degree delta T at that coils, at those coils, we need a thousand GPM. Well, in a primary secondary system, the flow rate through each chiller is constant. So if we only have 750 GPM of flow, we end up having deficit flow in the bypass line. We send a warmer water temperature out to the chillers and the flow rate keeps going up and keeps going up. So in a primary secondary system, we have to turn an additional chiller and pump operate. We have to turn them on. Now each of these chillers, although one chiller has enough capacity to satisfy the load, we don't have enough flow to satisfy the load. So when we turn an additional chiller on, we turn another chilled water pump on. If it's a water cooled system, another condenser water pump and likely another cooling tower fan. And we end up operating two chillers at 40% low load along with our ancillary equipment and the system becomes inefficient. So, but that's about the only thing you can do in a primary secondary system. How about in a variable primary flow system? Now this was really brought up uh, first in, I'll say in the 1990s by Gil Avery. He referred to it as over pumping chillers. In a VPF system, if we have manifolded the pumps, we're not confined to staying at the design flow rate. Remember the chillers have the design flow rate, they have the minimum flow rate, and then they have the maximum flow rate. We can go anywhere from the design all the way up to the maximum flow rate. As long as we don't go above that, we're fine. So instead of turning another chiller on, we simply allow the pumps to keep ramping up. We pump more water through that evaporator and we are able to fully load that chiller even though it's only getting a 10 degree delta T. So this allows a variable primary flow system to respond to low delta T issues, but it doesn't fix them. They can only be fixed out at the air side, out of the coils. So we would prefer, and I suggest we, we should fix the problem, cure the disease instead of uh, treating the symptom. So this is what happens in our system. We now pump instead of 750 GPM through the chiller, we pump a thousand, we satisfy the flow rate, we satisfy the loads, and we are working well with the exception is we're pumping a lot more water than we should be and our system efficiency might not be as, as good. Um, there's an ASH rate transaction paper on degrading chilled water plant delta T's causes and mitigation that is available. It Since it's a transactions paper, it is for uh, pay. Um, our company didn't write it. Um, but the uh, consulting engineer out on the West Coast did. It's an excellent treatise on curing or the causes for your low delta T and also how, how we can fix those. So we talked about the advantages and disadvantages of dedicated and manifold pumps. Let's move on to the next one, uh, buffer tank sizing. Why would we use buffer tanks? When, how, and where should they be installed? So the first is the why. Um, in order to maintain a leaving chilled water set point, chillers will have a loop time dependent on their controllers, their unit controllers. 
and the loop time for the smaller chillers with less sophisticated controllers is higher than the loop time for the larger chillers that have more sophisticated controls. And this is to keep the return water temperature from changing too fast and giving instability in our supply water temperature. Um, this can happen if we have a short water loop. Say we have an air-cooled chiller outside uh, a school and the air handlers are right inside the wall. There isn't much system water volume. The water gets back to the chiller very quickly and we have a low loop time. So how big? Well, the required volume in your system is going to be equal to the flow rate times whatever the manufacturer tells you their required loop time is. So that might be one, two, or four or five for some small chillers. So we compare that required system volume with our actual system volume. How much water is in the chiller evaporator, in that barrel, in the pipes, in the coils that are active, and in the storage tank. And if the system volume is less than the required volume, we have to find some way to mitigate that. Well, there are a couple ways to do that. Uh, one low cost way if, is if these values are close to one another is to make your pipes in the manifolds a little bit bigger, not your bypass pipe, but the manifolds a little bit bigger to increase the water volume in them. You could also increase the delta T because since tons is equal to GPM times delta T divided by 24 for water, if you increase the delta T, you decrease the flow rate, the GPM, and when you multiply that lower flow rate times the loop time, you might now meet the system volume requirements. But if you don't, where should that bypass, where should that, that buffer tank go to increase the system volume? A lot of times people want to put it on the supply side to uh, if the chiller goes down or turns off, we still have some cold water going out to our coils. Uh, the issue is if we put it on the supply side and this bypass valve opens quickly, the return water temperature to the to chillers changes quickly and we again have a short loop. So where we should install it is on the return side of the line and on the chiller side of the bypass line. What we, so what this allows us to do, this gives us stable control. If our loop time is too short, we install it on that return side and we install enough capacity to get us up to our required loop time. Uh, the other thing I, tell, I like to share is that once you're required to put a buffer tank into the system, um, it usually doesn't cost a lot more to make it a little larger. So a little bit more volume, while not required, generally will give you, especially on a small chillers and chiller plants, give you more stable system control. Not chiller control, but the system will operate more smoothly. So the last thing the Board of Governors picked in the pick six menu was variable condenser water flow. And this is a question that I get asked a lot. Should we vary the condenser water flow rate? Well, when you start to vary the condenser water flow rate, the first thing you have to do is figure out how far can we uh, slow down that flow rate? And it's going to be the highest of three different flow rates. The first is, what's the minimum flow rate for the cooling tower? And frankly, that's probably the biggest limitation in most applications. If you go below the tower's minimum flow rate, you get poor heat transfer. Your leaving water temperature goes up, but even worse, you get some splash from the wetted portions of the, of the tower to the dry portions and you get scaling. Scaling is really hard to clean up on cooling towers. The next one is, stay above the chiller's minimum condenser water flow rate. We talked about that earlier. If you go below the minimum flow rate, heat transfer gets poor, the efficiency gets worse, the refrigerant temperature and pressure in the condenser go up because the approach temperature goes up and you end up uh, having unstable chiller control. The third one, every, uh, 
this doesn't happen very often, but every once in a while it does. So you, you want to check it. And that is in a cooling tower from the basin of the tower up to the top of the tower is an open part of the, the loop. The pump needs to be operating at a speed and pressure at which it can overcome the elevation of the cooling tower, that static tower lift. And if you go below that speed, you'll suddenly get no flow rate over the cooling tower. So that's one thing to check out. Where is the pump operation going to be? What's its minimum pump speed to make sure we overcome the tower static lift? Once we do that, now we have to figure out how are we going to control the condenser water pump speed, the cooling tower fan speed, and the chiller in order to optimize the sum of the chiller plus condenser water pump plus cooling tower fan KW. And frankly, it's hard because you have to do it at every different load condition at every different wet bulb temperature condition. All the controls providers have ways to do it for you today, but they're pretty much all black boxes. So you, you have to trust the controls provider to do it, which, which is a choice. Um, the other thing, you have to make sure you don't reduce the condenser water pump flow rate so fast that the chiller goes into a surge region. Because when we reduce the flow rate, the leaving condenser water temperature goes up and we can't get into surge if we still have high wet bulb temperatures. Uh, finally, you want to make sure as an engineer you sequence, develop a sequence of operation. You make sure it's commissioned properly so it can take some time to do this. So is the juice worth, worth the squeeze? Uh, we're going to go through a couple system types. Uh, we're going to start with variable speed drives on all the chillers. Not necessarily optimal, but that's what we're going to start with. Then variable speed drives on the cooling tower fans. That's required in most cases by ASHRAE standard 90.1 and your local energy code. We're going to start with the condenser design flow rate of 3 GPM per ton, which with less efficient chillers was a 10 degree delta T. With today's chillers, it's 9.3 to 9.4 degrees and a constant flow condenser water pump. We're going to control the leaving tower set point so that the sum of chiller plus tower energy consumption is at its, is at its lowest. And we're going to balance those two to get the, the, the optimal system control. So in a particular case, we took this uh, and we have a variable speed chiller. We have variable speed uh, cooling tower fan constant flow condenser designed at 3 GPM per ton. We control our cooling tower to optimize the sum of the chiller plus tower energy consumption and our annualized operating KW per ton for the plant without the chilled water pump, but the chiller condenser water pump and cooling towers is 0.546 KW per ton. Pretty good. So what happens if we can reduce and vary the condenser water pump speed? Are there savings? And the answer is yes, because there are some times when we can reduce the condenser water pumps a speed, reduce its flow rate, reduce the condenser water pump power, and we save in the range of 3.8, about 4% of your chiller plus chilled water, condenser water pump plus cooling tower fan energy annually. So on an existing system, this uh, is something that we might want to look at. Um, another option is to look at what the industry is telling us. The ASHRAE Green Guide says that rather than the 3 GPM per ton, we should use 12 to 18 degree delta T on the condenser water side. The Advanced Energy Design Guide for hospitals says a 14 degree delta T, reduce the flow rate. Uh, at Steve Taylor's ASHRAE Journal article from December of 2011 and the ASHRAE Learning Institute Chill Water course says start with at least a 15 degree delta T. That is reduce the flow rate. Well, if it's a new system, we can design it with, again, a constant flow condenser water pump at the reduced flow rate of 2 GPM per ton. There's no magic number, but we get to almost exactly the same savings is varying the condenser water pump on a plant designed at 3 GPM per ton. But in this case, there's no control complexity. 
because we are not varying the condenser water pump flow rate and we don't have to account for all those different operating conditions. Next, let's take it to the end. Um, what happens if we both reduce the design flow rate and vary the flow rate? At that point, there are very little savings available. We've already gotten to a pretty close to an optimal system operation with our design characteristics by reducing that condenser water flow rate. When we did this examination, we looked at it in four different climates, you know, here in the upper Midwest, Chicago, Memphis, more humid climate, a dry climate, and a hot and humid climate all the time. We did it for two different types of load profiles, um, that is hospitals that have a lot larger load profile, office buildings, which are, which are more cyclical. And we did two choices, the higher design flow rate with variable flow or the lower design flow rate with constant flow. And the performance is almost the same in all cases. There was an exception in Miami because it was hot and humid. There was no savings at all for putting a variable speed drive on the condenser water pump. So if you do any design in a climate like that, um, there aren't savings available. So from guidance uh, on existing systems, if people want to reduce their um, chiller chill water plant KW per ton and increase their efficiency, there's some savings available. It's complex, but it is available. People have done it in the past. If it's a new plant though, and you design it for the, the 1.7 to 2.3 GPM per ton, you're already in an optimal range. You can set and forget the condenser water pump speed, use it to balance the flow rate, a variable speed drive on it to balance the flow rate, but you don't have to have the complexity by selecting the proper system flow rate and delta T. So those are the pick six, but there's a bonus. And this bonus is um, we've done some investigation and I've had a chance to look all over uh, many countries. And I always ask in a chilled water seminar, does anybody know where the 10 degree delta T came from? And what we found, you know, we saw in the ASHRAE green guide and we saw ASHRAE 90.1 is that they're telling us to increase the flow rate, increase the delta T's and decrease the flow rates. The real driver is chiller performance, COP has gone up by 50 to 70% over the last 40 years. Pump performance hasn't changed. The part load we now use variable speed drives. Same thing on cooling tower fans. But the chiller performance really has led us to, well, you have to have the chiller work harder. Its COP is between six and seven. If a pump has a CO, uh, an efficiency of 70%, its COP is 0.7. Work the most efficient part of the chiller system a little bit harder. We have that 15 degree delta T coil selection. All of the industry recommendations, the green guide, the advanced energy design guides, the chilled water system learning course, they say increase the delta T's, reduce the flow rates. So where in the heck did 10 come from? Most of the time when I ask that question, the answer is slide rules. Something to do with dividing by 10. Well, that might be true, but if we had a 12 degree delta T, multiplying by two GPM per ton is easier than multiplying by 2.4 on the chilled water side. So maybe not. The second one is the HRI rating standard, 550, 590, uses that as their standard conditions. Well which is the chicken and which is the egg? I'm not sure. Uh, the best answer I ever got, and this is not commercial, a Willis Carrier was brilliant. He's the only man in our, the only person in our industry recognizes times 100 most important people of the 20th century with what he and Mr. Train did with air conditioning is absolutely astounding. I was in San Diego and asked a question and an elderly gentleman stood up and said, I believe that Dr. Carrier in the 1940s looked at systems and found that those were the optimal temperature differences. I've been looking for the papers. I would love to read what he wrote. I haven't been able to find them. But even if he was right in the 1940s, chiller efficiencies have gotten so much better that working them a little bit harder makes sense. 
the most historical information that I've found, it goes back to 1935. Um, cooling in the United States air conditioning and theaters started in uh, Indiana and Kentucky, and they put cool wall water through the coils. And in 1935, this is from an article, I'll let you read it. To maintain 80 degrees and a 50% relative humidity, they got a 10 degree delta T through that coil. Now our industry doesn't move fast, and we might have been doing the same thing for the last 85 years, but what the industry is telling us is we can do better today. Let's listen to the, what the industry is telling us. Um, I'd like to leave you with two things. First of all, uh, ASHRAE has a strategic plan approved by the board of directors about a year and a half ago. Please take a chance to go out and look at it. We want to, uh, there are four initiatives. The, the last one really is based on what can we do for you as chapter members? Um, what value can we bring through your chapter officers, through the region? We have our Rick Hermans, your di director and regional chair on today. How can we help you get what you need for your day-to-day -day jobs? The others have to do with resilient buildings and communities and think of indoor environmental quality, what we're going through right now without what Rick, uh, Bill Bonfleth, presidential member leading the epidemic task force have put together with respect to response to COVID. That shows the impact that you and we and ASHRAE have on our global environment and on the health and safety of our buildings. So um, as was asked by Adam, please fill out the evaluation form before you leave. Uh, I do have a couple minutes for questions, Adam, if we want to take them uh, before we get to the other room for the second presentation. And particularly thanks for all the volunteers, people who volunteered in the past and are now, and also for the future volunteers. Adam, I'll turn it back over to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Mick. Uh, we did have one question come in in the chat from Rick Hermans asking about bypass pressure drop. Uh, so his question was, what is a good pressure drop through the bypass line? If other people have questions while we work through this one, send them in the chat. Or uh, I think Dan figured out that you could chuck an emoji in the chat, and then he can unmute you. OK. So. <laughs> Great, thanks. Uh, so Rick, um, I've never heard somebody say what the pressure drop should be, um, but it, it's equal to about 10 pipe diameters or two elbows. Um, so it's a small pressure drop, but not zero, because zero gets us to that, that short circuiting of, of chilled water flow rate. Uh, if you have another answer, I'd love to be able to share it with folks. So uh, perhaps if you put that in, in the chat, um, uh, we would be very open to your expertise. Rick has been involved in the industry in chilled water plants for 40 years or so. All right, another question came in. Uh, this is from Jerry. For variable primary flow systems, is bypass pipe location important in relation to keeping the loop times above the minimum? Ah, great question. So if the, the question I think is predicated on if we put the bypass line in the chilled water plant and we have a control valve there, when we open up that control valve, we can get a, a significant and fast reduction in the return water temperature. And, and okay, from a chiller unit control standpoint, it really isn't the loop time that's required. It's the return water temperature shouldn't change too fast. Well, if we're in a variable primary flow system and we are controlling that bypass valve properly and it's in the plant, we are not going to have problems with a short loop time because the return water temperature won't change quickly. However, if we have a, a chill water, if we have an oversized bypass line, an oversized bypass valve, and it's a butterfly valve, and we open at 20%, we get the full flow rate, and our return water temperature changes quickly, and therefore our loop time is too low. 
So some designers do put a buffer tank in the return side of their bypass line in a variable primary flow system. Um, it's not required if the valve is con being controlled properly, but it does give you some, so, some buffer, if you will, if uh, things aren't done properly from a control standpoint. Um, some other designers will put the bypass line out in the system. Uh, one thing there is you want to make sure that you hardwire out to that valve so that when you get close to the minimum flow rate, that valve can act quickly and you don't end up getting close to the minimum flow rate, having that control signal go through the building automation system and the valve doesn't open up fast enough, we go below the chiller's minimum flow rate and the chiller shuts off. So like uh, manifold and dedicated pumps, there are advantages and disadvantages to all the locations in which we can put the bypass line in a variable primary flow system. Thanks, Jerry. All right, uh, I don't see any more okay. questions coming in. So I think we'll go ahead and do the poll. So Mick, if you'll kindly jump to the, the ethics chat room. I will do that. Thanks everyone for coming and I'll be over there in a minute. Thank you again. Uh, as we said earlier, please take the time to fill out this DL evaluation. It's uh, requested by society and, and useful for keeping uh, track of DLs and what their uh, performances are throughout the year. Um, thank you again for attending. And if you're joining the ethics chat, we'll talk to you again in a few minutes. Thanks.